Are you accused of uh, undermining the hopes of people who uh, <laughs> think of near-death experiences as proof of an afterlife? In a way, I have to say yes. I believe that everything happening is in the brain, okay? Uh, and nothing extracorporeal that we could speak of. If there were so, we could not detect it. <laughs> I have no idea how to even detect uh, such an entity. Jimo, your work on the uh, neurocorrelates, particularly the neurotransmitter correlates of uh, the death experience are fascinating in terms of seeing this surge of neurochemicals, uh, serotonin, dopamine, and also GABA, which is inhibitory, leading to the uh, a, a dramatic change in the brain and, and, and its relationship. And you've hypothesized that um, these are caused by a lack of oxygen and the brain reacting to that lack of oxygen. Given that to be the case, how does that reflect on, shall we say, the uh, the popular version of near-death experiences that this is somehow a, uh, a, a vision of a uh, of heaven or an ultimate reality of, of light and comfort and, and, and great uh, kind of uh, uh, transformation. Yes, yeah, near-death experience is really fascinating, uh, subjective experience, clearly subjective, because if they don't tell you, we don't know uh, what happened in their brain during their comatose period. And uh, it, now it's reported from more than I think it's millions of people now across the world. And uh, it's independent of the religious beliefs, independent sure. of the cultural beliefs, and uh, which is amazing. There's, there's a lot of common features. Not every near-death experience is identical, but their commonality is quite striking. Uh, for, for instance, one thing is that people see light at the end of the tunnel or a bright light. Uh, people experience out-of-body experience uh, feeling their bodies floating in the air, maybe even looking at themselves, their own body from the ceiling, a different vantage point. Uh, many people recall the entire life flashing across their uh, brain and look at uh, life review. Others uh, may even perceive uh, conversations in their surround uh, during the uh, comatose period. And while others feel like this near-death experience actually changed them, after they survive this NDE, they come back as changed person, they feel like they want to change a job, they feel like they have a renewed appreciation of uh, uh, somebody else's position, uh, so people call it empathy, uh, so they understand other people better. So I think these are really quite uh, striking. So I think if they're coming from the brain, which I believe they are, uh, there, there has to be neural signatures of these experiences. So if we can uh, identify neural signatures of these subjective experiences using rather objective means, that means that the hard problem of consciousness is not so hard after all, mm -hmm. that there is a way to crack them. Uh, in fact, using conventional, now a standard neurological method, is, it is possible to, to do. So, um, for instance, I believe that a, that a highly activated secretion of dopamine may be contributing to the extremely positive experience of the, uh, reported by these survivors of a uh, near-death crisis. And realer than real uh, a sensation may be contributed by the high levels of uh, norepinephrine, which is the alert molecule in human brains, at nighttime when we're sleeping, norepinephrine levels low, but when during the daytime when you're awake and when you're highly excited, the norepinephrine level is very high. But in, in, uh, in rat brain, at least, norepinephrine levels reaches more than 40-fold uh, during the dying, dying phase. So the realer than real experience may come from the huge uh, increase of norepinephrine in the brain. And we know that a visual, for instance, a visual sensation comes from uh, two streams originated from the occipital lobe, visual cortex, 
goes both to, there's a ventral stream that goes to temporal lobe, there's a dorsal stream goes to parietal lobe. We discovered in the dying patients both, uh, um, so there's a bi-directional connectivity, functional connectivity in the gamma frequency between the temporal lobe and occipital lobe, which is visual cortex, as well as between the parietal lobe and uh, visual cortex, they're extremely high. The level is very high, suggesting the, that might be the neurological basis of visual sensation in the dying patients. We also discovered the tem, uh, so-called temporal parietal junction, TPJ, on the left side is extremely hot. Okay, This is a left side is hot zone. So that may suggest, because that area includes the verticus area, which is a speech perception. So suggesting these patients, at least one, one or two of these patients, may be able to perceive the conversation in their surroundings, may hear their loved one's voices during this dying phases. Mm. And so what are the implications of that in, in terms of uh, interpretation of near-death experiences as, uh, as being in touch with a true transcendent reality as opposed to just uh, uh, oxygen-deprived induced neurochemicals? Um. I don't know how to interpret whether that as transcendent experience, but I think uh, uh, there is connection with the reality. That is, uh, these if they're able to perceive conversation uh, that happening around them, that is, uh, their loved ones are nearby, they're calling their names, they're maybe in a very uh, 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 poor I and mean, sad situation. So those sounds and conversations may uh, stimulate the memories in these patients, the dying patients, that uh, is very deeply embedded in their memory system. That, uh, so they stimulate the TPJ activation. So I think there may be true that the dying patients can actually hear the conversations surrounding going on, because these, yeah. Yeah, these are involuntary function of the brain. Yeah, but it's triggered by the neurochemical uh, eliciting um, memories uh, from the brain. Yes, you, yes. You don't need any external reality of these I, things occurring. Right. So you have, so this is, this is speech perception. So they might be able to hear if their loved ones nearby saying things to them. But on the other hand, they could also have life review. That is, uh, these uh, lack of oxygen stimulates the recall of a deeply emotional memories in their brain. So I, uh, it's difficult to tell or to tease apart some of these subjective experiences from the pathways we identified because some pathways, as you know, that EEG electrode covers millions of neurons. Uh, maybe we're, we're from one electrode, we may be looking at multiple different phenomena simultaneously. So I think that's a possibility. We have to look at higher resolution, maybe uh, intracortical rec uh, cortical recordings and so forth. But it's um, uh, ultimately, it is a doable experiment, doable eventually with higher resolution EEG or ECOG studies. So uh, life review, on the other hand, uh, is purely in their memory. So I think it's emotional memory, deeply held beliefs and those may be stimulated by the lack of oxygen. And what kind of functions they have is unclear at this moment. Okay. Has your work been um, criticized by those who believe that near-death experiences are a uh, are contact with a, a true transcendent reality with mm -hmm. God or whatever the culture is? Uh, because you're showing the neural uh, correlates of it and that it, it, it's directly affected to the lack of oxygen triggering this cascade of very elevated uh, neurotransmitter cocktail. Uh, yes. So are, are you accused of uh, undermining the, the hopes of people who uh, <laughs> think of near-death experiences as proof of an afterlife? In a way, I have to say yes, <laughs> because I was interviewed by somebody who was trying to uh, interpret NDE as some kind of loving experience. It's because they're having this very positive experience. Maybe it's indication of their, lo their loved ones 
who are dying actually go into a better world and maybe so I think that's something that the interviewer was trying to make me say in the whether whether our data was saying that I said well um, I don't think we have evidence of that and everything was happening in the brain okay so for instance in our uh, two of the four patients their EEG activity stopped reached the flat line uh, toward the very end, uh, before the heart completely stopped. So at least the high frequency functional activity is, uh, is stopped earlier. So I believe that everything happening is in the brain, okay? Uh, and nothing extracorporeal that we could speak of. If there were a soul, we could not detect it. <laughs> I have no idea how to even detect uh, such an entity. Uh, but if, he, if the goal is to go into heaven, I guess it's nice to know there is no hell to go to. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, but what, all we can do is to speak from the evidence. I mean, I think that the you, evidence... You don't need any extra corporality uh, to explain uh, all the data that you see. Correct. Yes. I mean, I think everything can be interpreted by the uh, brain activity uh, uh, not not for everybody, because the the experiences quite, can be diverse from people to people, from culture to culture. For instance, if you uh, grew up in the Western world, uh, Christianity is is the environment you grew up in. The the figures you uh, in your uh, uh, dream or in your uh, in the NDE might remind you of Jesus. But uh, if somebody grew up in the Middle East and maybe in the Muslim tradition, they might think it's uh, Muhammad. Or, or so I think that, or if somebody is in the in the uh, uh, Eastern religions, they might think of a different figure. So I think it's it's highly related to somebody's cultural background, how they grew up, what they were taught when they were little, which is all so, embedded in the brain. So it's yes, completely, exactly, completely consistent with your model. Totally. So one fascinating story I wanted to share is that uh, uh, you probably remember or know about Tangshan earthquake in China it happened 1976. Uh, so many people died. And there was a study published by a Chinese physician in Tianjin Hospital. He interviewed many survivors asking about whether they had any uh, abnormal mental experiences when, they, uh, when the earthquake happened. Uh, I remember uh, distinctly when I was reading the paper, one factory worker, which is a young woman, uh, were recalling that uh, she was remembering the event when she was rewarded, uh, get, got medal because she was the best worker of the year in the, in the factory. She was on the stage receiving the, the medal, and that moment came to her, to her mind when she was dying. Oh. <laughs> so I think it's... It, it appears to be a highly emotional event that you recall uh, as part of the experience. So I think um, perhaps religious uh, teachings and uh, figures and are such uh, uh, memories in people's mind, depending on their degree of, of course, exposure to those ideologies and would come to, come to them and remind them perhaps, and also the extremely pleasant, heavenly sceneries that, that appears in their mind may remind them that's where they are. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, we don't have the data to explain every single kind of experiences, but I think now we have the framework. We can begin ready to under, try to investigate all of these subjective experiences using similar neurological tools that are standard uh, to uh, scientists. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing. Closer to Truth is now accepting your tax-exempt donations. Please come to closertotruth.com forward slash donate. Thank you very much for supporting us and thanks for watching.